thank you again for the invitation to talk tonight and, and coming on the heels of Manal. I, I was really struck by the hamburger. I'm kind of hungry tonight. So uh, thanks for that that visual image, Manal. And, and again, an excellent presentation just to reiterate what Mia said. So my task is to pick up where you left off and walk through very quickly pharmacologic treatments for fatty liver. Again, a very short period of time to do that. So we'll do this very quickly. And, and not to reiterate what, um, what Manal went through, but if we think about in the absence of FDA approved therapy, how do we target therapies that are advantageous for our patients? And I think we take a patient-centered approach. We tackle the overweight and obesity. Manal went through very nicely. <laughs> weight loss strategies, exercise, and diet. And I just highlight this one um, uh, study recently published looking at around a quarter of a million participants followed for up to seven years. For every thousand step increment, there was a reduction of all cause mortality by 15%. And for a 500 step increment, around a 7% reduction in CV mortality. So the more you walk, the better it is. We're not talking about vigorous exercise, we're just talking about increasing your step count. And Manal went through co, uh, cofactors, dietary modifiers, I'm not gonna relive that. And then treating each comorbidity I think is important. Right now we have uh, kind of a new kid on the block, if you will, GLP-1 receptor agonist with uh, semaglutide and terzepatide that are being used uh, quite frequently now to manage both diabetes and obesity. And this is something I even use in my clinical practice uh, routinely. Managing uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and sleep apnea also are important. So just jumping right into, again, therapies that could be used today, GLP-1 receptor agonists are pleiotrophic in helping to reduce liver lipids, but this happens vicariously. There are no GLP-1 receptors in the liver. So by working to improve um, weight, uh, weight loss through modifying GLP-1, what happens is you improve insulin sensitivity at the peripheral adipocyte level. And when you reduce insulin uh, resistance, I'm sorry, when you improve insulin resistance or reduce insulin resistance and improve insulin sensitivity, you reduce free fatty acid flux to the liver. And when you reduce free fatty acids, you reduce lipotoxic stress and ultimately downregulate inflammation. And theoretically, you should have a positive impact on fibrosis. So just jumping to the data, uh, when we look at NASH trials, there's been one very large phase 2B trial with semaglutide in NASH patients. The doses were given subcutaneously, weekly, um, and uh, we see the results were very, very promising. Uh, here is the illustration on MASH resolution. And you see it's 59% for the high dose. And the high dose here is, is not the dose we would use today to manage obesity, but rather these were more in the line with diabetic doses. So 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 versus placebo. And you see the high dose has a treatment effect delta of around 42%. And again, this was a 72 week trial where we see impacts on MASH resolution that are very, very encouraging. However, when we look at fibrosis improvement, and we're here targeting at least one stage improvement of fibrosis without worsening of MASH, we see there's not a dose response. <clears throat> the best dose is actually the lowest dose, and the high dose is just peripherally better than placebo, and the middle dose is no better than placebo. So there's lots of theory as to what's going on here, one of those is because there are no GLP-1 receptors in the liver, the action is all peripheral and it's just taking longer to get to fibrosis regression. And so perhaps we need to treat longer than 72 weeks to have a fibrosis benefit if you're using a GLP-1. Now, terzepatide on the other hand is a GLP-1 GIP agonist. That data is expected in the first uh, quarter of 2024 and the jury's still out on that combination. Additionally, there's drugs looking at GLP-1 glucagon agonist, and Altimmune has a trial in phase 2B, paired liver biopsy trial, 
and we're waiting for that result as well. So there are glucagon receptors in the liver. There are not GIP receptors. Uh, so yet to be determined if there's a strong enough effect on metabolism with terzepatide to have an impact on fibrosis in a relatively short period of time. Does adding glucagon to the GLP-1 actually uh, you know, provide that additional fibrosis benefit? The jury's still out. And of course, now there are triple Gs, GLP-1, glucagon, uh, and GIPs that are being studied as well. Jury's still out there. Nonetheless, semaglutide does have additional benefits on glycemic control, body weight, major adverse cardiac event reduction, and even kidney disease. So it's important to understand these additional benefits knowing that the number one reason for death in these patients is cardiovascular. What about safety? Well, overall, it's well tolerated. However, about a third of patients are unable to continue to take the medication for the long haul because of nausea, diarrhea, and other GI-related issues <clears throat> that really center around the way the drug works, which would be gastroparesis, inducing the nausea, and then additionally, the GI side effects of diarrhea, in some cases, constipation, and abdominal pain. And then there's the unknown variable of sarcopenia. Does the weight loss that's occurring in these settings um, have anything to do with lean muscle loss? Is it all fat loss? And I think there's some studies that suggest it's a mixture. So does this become an issue in cirrhotic patients, in elderly patients at increased risk for falls? More data needs to be generated. Um, so moving on real quick to uh, the PIVNS trial, looking at vitamin E and pioglitazone, there is evidence that both of these drugs are effective on resolution of NASH. You see vitamin E 36% versus 21 for placebo, pioglitazone 46 versus 21. So these drugs also can be used uh, to treat the disease while we wait for FDA approved therapy directly. Here's the data looking at a combination of trials with pioglitazone, whether you treat for six months or 18 months or up to two years, there are benefits on steatosis, inflammation, certainly NASH resolution. It's a little bit more of a mixed bag on fibrosis benefit. So what about moving forward? Well, to get full approval with the regulatory framework, you need to have an impact on outcomes. So here we're talking major adverse liver outcomes, decompensation, death, transplant, a meld going from less than 12 to greater than 15. However, there's another way to get conditional approval or inter intermediate approval, and that is subpart H. And this is based on a surrogate endpoint that's reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And there are two of them. MASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis and at least one stage improvement with, of fibrosis without worsening of NASH or so you could do uh, some trials look at both MASH resolution and fibrosis improvement others that are targeting more on NASH resolution might just go for MASH resolution versus fibrosis improvement and vice versa the EMA asks for both of these to be part of the uh, surrogate framework. So just real quickly, there are three drugs for phase three, uh, resmeterone, semaglutide, and lanafibrinor. And where they are, uh, resmeterone has completed its subpart H trial and submitted to the FDA with a target PDUFA date of March 24. Semaglutide is still recruiting and lanafibrinor is still recruiting. So real quickly with the drug that's in the lead right now, thyroid hormone receptor beta, when we think about hepatic lipid metabolism, THR beta increases lipophagy and beta oxidation. So you're burning more fatty acids. It enhances mitophagy or the generation of new mitochondria to help uh, handle this increased energy load. It reduces oxidative stress inflammation and has impacts also on cholesterol metabolism. We see lowering of LDL cholesterol. And you might ask very quickly, why do we use a thyroid drug to treat fatty liver? So fatty liver patients are relatively hypothyroid. They cannot convert T4 to T3 effectively. So just giving Synthroid or thyroid hormone will not work. It'll still not convert T4 to T3. You need to give a THR beta agonist. It's very liver directed to do that. 
So there are four phase three programs that have been done with this drug called resmetarone. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them today, but suffice it to say there's enough data here to submit an NDA and seek uh, approval. I'm just going to show the Maestro NASH trial design. This is a one-year trial where liver biopsies were done showing NASH with F1B, F2, or 3 to get into the study, and a biopsy done at the end of one year, again, targeting a dual primary endpoint of MASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis or fibrosis improvement with no worsening of NASH. You didn't have to hit both, just had to hit one or the other. This is an ongoing trial. The goal is to carry this trial out to 54 months to get to an outcome. This is a surrogate in intermediate endpoint 52 weeks. So it's an oral once daily medication for MASH resolution. Both doses had highly significant results compared to placebo with treatment effect deltas of 16 and 20% respectively for low and high dose. For fibrosis improvement, also highly significant for both doses relative to placebo. So both doses hit on both endpoints. As far as additional benefit, a key secondary endpoint was LDL cholesterol lowering. You see significant for both doses here relative to placebo. So from a safety perspective, overall very well tolerated. There were around 25 to 30 percent mild, uh, mainly mild to moderate GI dis, uh, disorders, nausea and diarrhea tended to occur very early in the course of treatment within days of starting therapy, tended to get better by week 12 and in many cases uh, abrogated completely. There is minimal reduction in the thyroid hormone axis, minimal reduction in pro-hormone free T4, no effect on active uh, free T3 or TSH. So real quickly with non-invasive tests, we have ways to risk stratify patients. We have ways to monitor response to therapy. And then we have impacts on predicting long-term outcome. I want to end with uh, Dr. Ranella was uh, also giving a lecture earlier uh, before mine. Uh, and Pi and really kind of led this effort uh, with the new guidance document. And I think it's very elegant. It targets primary care in blue, GI hepatology in orange, and then either in green. And we start with Fib4. Values less than 1.3, we can follow those patients. We don't need to do anything other than advocate for lifestyle modification. Values greater than 2.67, we need to get those guys over to hepatology and GI because those are the at-risk patients. They're at the upper end of Fib4. Those that fall in the indeterminate zone between 1.3 and 2.67, we ask that you do a second test, either a fiber scan or an ELF in this particular case. If those values are low, you see less than eight for VCT, less than seven, seven for ELF, just put them into a surveillance uh, mode. If they're indeterminate or high, refer those people on to GI and HEP. Once they're at the GI and hepatology care, we're going to do a secondary risk assessment and consider potential other non-invasive tests. If they're low risk, follow up with PCP. And if they're indeterminate or high risk, you have to make a decision, consider a liver biopsy, or if you suspect cirrhosis, manage them appropriately. If a liver biopsy is done, we have three different groups, stage zero, one, two to three, or four. If they're stage zero or one, again, circle back to just standard reassessment, lifestyle modification. Two to three, stage two to three, reassess, consider pharmacotherapy. Again, potential FDA approved therapy for this population coming in the spring of 24 or consider a clinical trial or other management options to include pioglitazone, vitamin E, GLP-1 use, et cetera. So uh, just to wrap up, when monitoring response to therapy, you can use FIB4 to monitor, monitor therapeutic intervention and to predict outcomes. Fiber scan, you can do the same. Values greater than or equal to 12 can predict outcomes. ELF score can be used to monitor therapy. Values greater than or equal to 11.3 predict outcomes. Pro-C3, not good at predicting outcomes, potentially helpful for monitoring response. MRI proton density fat fraction, very good at monitoring response. 30% or greater relative reduction has been shown to be predictive of NASH resolution, in some cases, fibrosis improvement. And then this newer test, CT1, 
greater than 80 millisecond reduction can be used to link and sync to a two point improvement in the NAFLD activity score. Values greater than 875 predict outcomes. And finally, MRE, we know that a 20% reduction is important because the coefficient of variance of MRE is around 19%. Values greater than 6.48 predict outcomes. So with that, let me wrap up the whirlwind tour of pharmacotherapy and NITs and turn it back over to you, Mia.